if you ride the subway in London or in Sydney, um, you will see this little sign as you get off the car has taken you from place to place, and it will say, mind the gap, okay? Because the transit authority is interested in your surviving your travel. They don't want you to drop into that space or catch yourself in that space between the end of the car and the, and the side of the, of the location and um, have a sudden Hades experience. So you're supposed to mind the gap. What I want to do is I want to mind the gap as we think about this space, the space between the events of Jesus' ministry Place somewhere between 27 to 33 A.D. You know, people think Jesus' ministry lasts for about three and a half years, and they can't decide whether Jesus was crucified in 33 or 30 A.D. So we're dealing with a period somewhere between 27 and 33, and the writing down of the Gospels, which down the road is somewhere between, usually um, conservatives will put, the Synoptic Gospels, either in the late 50s or 60s. More liberal scholars will push it out to the 80s and 90s for the Synoptic Gospels. And virtually everyone has agreed that John's Gospel was written in the 90s. Okay? So this gap that we are talking about in terms of time is a gap of anywhere from 30 years all the way out to 60 years. Now that's important. You know, we've been spending the last week examining an event that took place 36 years ago. Okay? And there's a lot of things that can happen, happen in the interim, in the gap. So the question is, I'm raising a question you probably don't think much about, and that is, what happened between the time of the event of Jesus and its recording and written down? And we have some people, including some scholars who say, Man, a lot happened to that story between what happened and when it got written down. So I want to look at this gap period. I want to mine the gap. This is the period of what is called orality. In the beginning, there were not books. In an, in an oral culture, people remembered things by the way they passed it on. In the beginning, there were no books. Okay. In the beginning, there was memory and the passing on of things by word of mouth. And we are primarily in an oral culture. And there are people who argue that tradition was loose in between what happened and what got written down. That in that gap period, a lot of stuff was going on. And if I had more time, I would take you through some quotes from very prominent New Testament people who would argue that memory is loose. They also would argue that memory is loose on the basis of psychological studies that have been done. Well, if memory is loose, notice what this does. Because when you're dealing with the gap, you're dealing with three ideas. You're dealing with how things get passed on orally. You're dealing with the eyewitnesses at the original events. And you're dealing with the quality of their memory. Those are the three things that you're dealing with when you're thinking about this gap period. So I want to talk about that a little bit. And I want to do it by introducing a conversation that I had with John Dominic Crossan. Now John Dominic Crossan was, is and was a very prominent historical Jesus scholar. He was one of the co-chairmen of the Jesus Seminar. And, uh, you know, this was the group that, that evaluated Jesus' utterances, you know, through beads. Okay, they were all childs of the 60s. And uh, so a red bead meant Jesus said exactly that. A pink bead meant that's pretty close to what Jesus said. A gray bead meant that's not Jesus' words, but it might reflect something Jesus said. And a black bead meant, meant Jesus didn't say that. And about 50% of what's in the Gospels, they rate it as black. Okay, so not a conservative, but writing and write, and they all do technical writing and that kind of thing. I mean, I'm glad they exist because that's why I have my job. 
And so, um, so we were at SMU, Southern Methodist University, and John Dominic Crossan got up to say this about this gap period. He said, I'm willing to concede that there are eyewitnesses who built into the tradition of the early church. But I'm here to say to you that in the time period between when that events happened and when the things were recorded, that memory is so poor that we cannot trust what the eyewitnesses say. Okay? So we're dealing with orality, we're dealing with memory, and we're dealing with eyewitnesses. He got up and cited a very famous psychological study on memory that rotated around the Challenger disaster. Now, you all remember what the Challenger was? That was the space shuttle that blew up that had Christine McAuliffe as one of the astronauts. Remember, she got picked out of teachers across the country to teach a class on science from space to the entire nation. And she never got the chance to do it because tragically the Challenger blew up on the way up into space. This is, you know, one of the great failures of NASA. Well, what they decided to do at Emory University in Atlanta was to call in freshmen and ask them a couple of questions. Where were you when you, when you heard about the Challenger disaster and how did you hear about it? Okay, and John Dominic Crossan is sharing this study. Three years later, on the premise that these students would now be seniors and be leaving campus soon, okay, probably a bad premise. Anyway, uh, three years later, they called them in and, said, and asked them the same set of questions. They compared the two sets of answers to one another, and in more than half the cases, there was a significant difference in the answers between what they said right after it happened and what they said three years later. With the group that was, um, that where the answers were, were distinct, they invited them back in and said to them, without identifying which was which, you had answered this question in two different ways. One time you said this, and one time you said that. What happened? And inevitably, the bulk of the responses were the answers that they gave more recently and not the answers against the background of the event back when it happened. And so John Dominic Crossan says, see, memory leaks. I can have an eyewitness to something and what they say happens changes over time. And as it changes over time, we actually get further away from the event and we have less certainty that what really happened is what really happened in the way in which an eyewitness describes it. Now I was asked to respond to this in a rebuttal, hearing it for the first time when he got up to speak. We were not given their papers ahead of time. So that was interesting to begin with. And, and so I got up, and my response was this. My response was, well, that's very, very interesting to ask that of freshmen at Emory University, but I wonder if you had done the same experiment with astronauts at NASA if you would have gotten the same results. Because a freshman at Emory University doesn't have anything at stake other than the national trauma of what that event represents for the space program. But an astronaut has everything at stake at what it is they're remembering. And I suggested, I think, I can't prove this, and I said that so at that time, that if we gave that kind of test to astronauts, the results would be different. Now, in fact, Memory studies have been done since then with people who are significantly invested in the memory that they have, and, the, and although the results aren't what we would call perfect, they are much, much better, which isn't surprising because there's something at stake. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I want to think through the way in which memory works in an oral world. I'm skipping some slides here. There are three ways in which, uh, in which memory got passed on in the ancient world, or three ways to portray how memory gets passed on in the ancient world. This is from New Testament scholars. And this listing that I'm about to give you comes from a man named Kenneth Bailey. And he says, one argument is the process is informal and uncontrolled. 
Okay? No one's overseeing it. No one's looking over it. It just happens. If you pick up a textbook on the introduction to New Testament by Bart Ehrman, he tells the story of someone wandering through the Mediterranean in the first century, sharing a miracle with Jesus, and there's no one overseeing how that takes place. He says that's how memory got passed on in the early church. So it's un informal and uncontrolled. And the people who say there's significant memory leak in the first century in the traditions associated with Jesus is basically presenting that model. That model comes from about the 1920s in terms of how it was presented and how it was laid out. There are names associated with it. Um, the second response, there was a pushback among some New Testament scholars who said, oh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, the basis, the cultural basis for the informal, uncontrolled approach to tradition was Icelandic folklore. Okay, now just think about where we are geographically for a second. Okay, it's much colder in Iceland. Okay, it does begin with an I. So we're, you know, at least we got the right letter of the alphabet to start off with. Okay, but obviously Icelandic folklore is a different kind of communication than what we're dealing with in Israel in the first century. So a group of New Testament scholars came along and said, now wait a minute. That is geographically dislocated. Let's look and see what's going on in the first century, and let's see what's going on within Jewish, within a Jewish context, in the rabbinic context, which we can push back to pretty close to the first century. And they argued that oral tradition in that context is formal and controlled. What they meant is it was overseen, there were certain people who were responsible for it, and they kept their eye on it, and then they made the observation, and this oral tradition was very, very precise. Okay? Almost the exact opposite conclusion of the informal and uncontrolled model. Sounds wonderful. One problem. You compare the Gospels to one another, and what you don't get is rote precision between the versions you get similarity and dissimilarity all mixed together. So the result doesn't look like what it is the rabbis were doing. Okay, So this was a correction, but it had the feel of an overcorrection, if you will. This led to the third model. This is the model that Bailey espoused. And Bailey did this because he worked among Bedouin tribes in the Middle East as a missionary for several terms. And he said, what I see among the missionaries is what I would call informal but controlled. Anyone can tell the story, but there are overseers of that story who, if it gets mistold, will correct the person telling the story. There is variation allowed, some variation allowed in the way the story is told, but the gist has to be the same. Okay, so this is what we call the gist approach to things. This is exactly what we see in the New Testament. My example for this in the New Testament is the way Luke retells the story of Jesus appearing to Saul in Acts. He tells that story three times, and the beauty of this is we've got the same writer in all three cases. So he tells it in Acts 9, he tells it in Acts 22, and he tells it in Acts 26. Every time there is a gist that is the same and there is variation in the details. One of the key figures in the first telling of the story is completely absent by the time he tells the story the third time. And this is coming from the same person. What that tells us is, is how stories were retold in the ancient world and the way in which that could work. And so what we see is this combination of gist and variation. Now when it comes to thinking about memory, because really this, this rises or falls in how we think about memory, uh, Bart Ehrman, another skeptic, talked about a study that was done of John Dean. Now that name should ring a bell in this part of the country. Okay? 
Because remember that John Dean, when he testified during Watergate, was said to have had a pretty good memory. And then afterwards, they discovered the tapes. So they could compare the facts of his testimony with the facts that were in the tapes. And of course, someone did this, okay, as part of a memory study. And what they found was is that John Dean's memory wasn't as great as people thought at the time that he testified. Sometimes he put conversations on different dates or in what the more common feature is, he combined conversations into one setting that happened on different days. That kind of thing. Okay? That kind of thing happened regularly in his testimony. And so Bart Ehrman came along and said, see, memory leaks. Even our great memory guys, you know, John Dean was kind of the Houdini of memory. Okay? Even, the, even our best memory guys make mistakes. He only quoted half the results of the study when he did that. Because the other point that the person doing the study said is this. But the gist of what it was that Dean was communicating and the core content of what was represented by all those conversations taken in aggregate, Dean was right on the money in terms of what he was communicating. So you had gist with variation, and in the midst of the gist with variation, what Dean absorbed about what basically was going on was what was going on. This is how I translate that in thinking about the Gospels. The disciples spent three and a half years with Jesus. They would have gotten what his self-perception was by what he taught. If they get the gist of what Jesus is about, and they're pretty clear about what the gist is, then we are dealing with that Jesus. Now, there are other ways to think about memory and orality. And that is, the Emory experiment was about what individuals remember. Church tradition and the tradition about Jesus is about what peoples remember. It's not just one person. This is a church tradition. It's a corporate tradition. Many people feed into it. The ability, if you will, to multiply correct exists when you're dealing with many people versus one person. And it's not surprising that when you think about it this way, that you get stories that are told in which there's gist and variation. Here's my analogy in our lifetime. All of us have been in scenes where we've been gathered as family or friends around someone who has passed away. Okay? There are very few instances in our world, by the way, where, oral, where orality is at work. Okay? We just we, we do a lot of recording. You know, Facebook is the death of orality. Okay? So, so you've got this, this orality thing happening when you gather around someone, and someone will share. And what inevitably happens when you gather together is you remember what you remember about the person. Right? So you're sitting there remembering what you remember about the person, and you share it. Okay? And someone else in the room may go, yes, I know that, and here's what I remember either about that event, or they tell another event that shows a similar characteristic. That kind of, that's the way that conversation works. Okay? So, when you have corporate memory, you're going to have themes that overlap, and you're going to have variation. Another thing to think about orality is this. And this I learned from my children and my grandchildren. Because they live, up until the point they kind of hit kindergarten, in an oral world. Okay? What they process, they have to remember. So, you know, I'm a dad with young kids, young grandkids, and we read them Bible stories at night. That's what we did. There are these wonderful Bible stories that Concordia Publishing, a Lutheran publisher published, that were in rhyme. Okay? So at night, when my daughters, I have two daughters and a son, first when my daughters went to bed, and then when my son went to bed, came along later, we would read these stories. And, you know, they'd get to pick the book and that kind of thing. And so I'd sit down and read it, and they were in rhyme. Well, you know, 
I'm a dad and there's I have a mischievous streak in me. I mean, you can almost sense it. So every now and again, just to see if they were with me, I would change the rhyme. Okay? And if they were following along, and generally speaking, they were, the reaction would be, Daddy, that's not how it goes. Or, if it's my grandkids, Opa, that's not how it goes. And they weren't done. Because they want to be sure I got it. Okay? They would turn around and repeat what it was supposed to be. This is before they were turning five and six. Okay? That's an oral world. Now, why do I mention that? I mention that because not only is it a reflection of morality, it's a reflection of something else that's going on with, this with these materials in this tradition, and that is these stories are being repeated over and over and over again. It isn't just a case that it happened back here in the 30s, and then someone said, oh, we better record it now, down here in the 60s, or the 80s, or the 90s. No, these stories were being shared again and again and again and again in church. They were being heard again and again and again and again in church, and then finally someone wrote it down. By the way, let's think about why we get the gap. We get the gap because why you've got the apostles around, you don't need to write it down. You can hear it directly from their lips. There's a very famous passage in Papias, an early 2nd century church father who says, I would rather hear a living voice, I'm paraphrasing, I would rather hear a living voice than to have something written down. Okay, to have a letter, okay, if you will. So, not only is it being repeated, but you've got the apostles around. Well, as you get to the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you're losing your apostles. So how are you going to tell those stories? You're going to record them. In fact, Justin Martyr called the Gospels apostolic memoirs. That was his name for them. And kind of like, what would you call a Gospel if you didn't know it was called a Gospel? That would be a good question. Okay, In the 2nd century, they called them apostolic memoirs. The memories of the Apostles. And so, not only are these stories repeated, not only is there someone overseeing it, okay, but they're being told again and again and again, and it's corporate memory. All those things help us to mind the gap. Okay? So that's what I want to say about orality, eyewitnesses, and memory. I have one other point that I want to make about the core theology of the New Testament. And I want to think about this gap. I've told you that this gap goes to like the 60s, in the 90s. So we're talking about 30 to 60 years. But let's work on this a little bit. We have the letters of Paul that talk about the core New Testament theology, what it is that the church taught. Okay? We know that theology is being expressed by Paul when he is writing. Those writings start to come to us from the year 49. We've just shortened our gap from 30 or 60 years down to about 15. Okay? That's step one. But here's the important step. The important step is when Paul has his experience of conversion, which that theology reflects. We are now somewhere between 18 months to two years within the events in Jerusalem. Okay? That gap is shrinking. Rather than leaping over tall buildings in a single bound to get there, it's a sidestep. It's even better than that. Because in order for Paul to process the experience that he had with Jesus at the moment at which I'm standing now, he had to have heard the teaching and preaching of the apostles before that in order to process what Jesus did when He appeared to Him. And, that, and remember, Paul lived in Jerusalem. He was among the Jewish leadership. He was well aware of what the Jewish position was on Jesus and everything that had been associated with those events. And now our gap is at best a sliver. And we're talking about the core theology of the early church. 
So my point here is that as we think about this gap, it's a gap of writing, but it's not a gap of teaching. The teaching, to use the words of that great theologian, Chris Berman, goes back, 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 almost to the beginning. And we're almost on top of the events themselves. So, it's a value to mine the gap. It's important to mine the gap. The gap potentially looks like it's a real problem. But what I'm suggesting to you is it's not as much of a problem as we think. And part of that may be because we live in such a non-oral culture. One of the other points that people like to make is if you live in an oral culture and your understanding depends on it, then you figure out ways to remember things you really care about. Thank you.